Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ancestry Extra webinar, We Must Have Swam Over, Research Strategies, Tips, and Tricks for Finding Your Immigrant Ancestor. My name is Kara McDonald, and I'm your host for today. I'm the Manager of Reference Services at the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21. So we're going to get started right away because there is a lot of information to go over. And let's start with the PowerPoint. Okay, so this webinar is really aimed towards people who have been searching for their immigrant arrival in the 1865 to 1935 databases and they haven't been able to find it. Uh, there's a variety of reasons why that happens and I'm going to talk about some of the ways that I research um, and you know some techniques that I use to to find those those hidden documents. So today we are going to be looking at the two main Canadian arrivals on Ancestry, and those are the Canadian passenger lists, 1865 to 1935, and also the smaller collection, which is the Canadian Ocean Arrivals, 1919 to 1924. So uh, if you have a, a family member ancestor who arrived sometime in this time period, so maybe sometime around 1919 or maybe sometime around 1924, check in both because these documents are not in this collection. All right. Oop. So why can't you find that immigration record in 1865 to 1935 when you know that it should be there? First and foremost, Oftentimes, the information that you have is not correct. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's unfortunate, but, you know, sometimes we base our research on the family oral histories and things like that, which we know aren't always 100% correct. Sometimes they are, but um, sometimes they're not. Uh, sometimes also we're going to see things like the name was spelled differently on the passenger list or the transcription isn't right of the of the name in the passenger list. They may have used a different given name. The age may not be correct in the database. Uh, the record might be really poor quality and so names aren't transcribed properly or at all. Uh, they could have arrived through a U.S. port and uh, or they came to Canada before 1865 or they came to Canada after 1935. So at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about those post-1935 arrivals and how to obtain those documents from the government. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to go over some effective search uh, techniques, some things that I do when I'm looking for that arrival that I just can't seem to find. So really important is to approach the search with a mindset that something on the document or in the transcription is wrong. Um, and that will allow you to, you know, really open up your year of arrival, year of birth, or, you know, the, the spellings of the names and things like that. Uh, you want to expand those research parameters. Uh, sometimes eliminating information can be helpful to find the record. Uh, I like to always leave out the port of departure, port of arrival, and the ship name when I'm doing my preliminary searching, unless I know exactly that, that it's exactly right. <clears throat> but otherwise, I'd leave that out. And sometimes, and I just search with a first name, a surname, a year of birth, and a year of arrival. My first searches with those years are always exact or plus or minus one in the birth year and the arrival year. And then what I'll do is keep expanding that and just do the search over and over again. So like exact birth and then I'll uh, do like a plus or minus one, plus or minus two, plus or minus five and leave the arrival date pretty exact. And then on the flip side, I'll use leave the birth date really exact and then uh, open up the year of arrival to capture as much as I can. It means doing the search over and over again, but once you kind of get into the flow of it, it's not so bad. If you're not able to find the record after playing with the dates, it's pretty much guaranteed that there's something wrong with the spelling of the name. Um, if you have an uncommon surname, 
sometimes I will just search for that with the year of birth and the year of arrival uh, and leave the, fir the first name out entirely and, and looking at those results. Uh, you can take the same approach with uncommon first names. So if you have an uncommon first name, just search for the first name and leave the surname out and then play with your years of birth and your years of arrival and, and, and look at everything. Review all your results and look at anything that looks good. And if, if nothing looks good, look at things that could be plausible. Like sometimes, you know, I look at it and I'm like, maybe, I don't know, it looks really bad. Eh, look at it anyway. And then you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, it's a transcription error. I can see why they thought that it was batters instead of butters or <laughs> whatever the case may be. So look at everything. Look at the original record. Uh, don't just base it on your, on, your, on your results that come up. So um, throughout, the, throughout the webinar, there's going to be these little pages with hot tips. So these are all kinds of little things that I've come into uh, over the 12 years that I have been researching immigration records. And uh, I can't, I don't have the time to go over every single one. So the, you can pause this at this point and kind of review them on your own. Or if you want to come back later and watch it again, you can kind of forward through to these sections and read them. I'm, uh, I'm going to try to address at least one, maybe two as I go along, things that I think that are probably the most important. So uh, for this section, I'm going to talk about those Form 30As, that 1919 to 1924 database. Uh, often the arrival year on those, uh, that arrival date is wrong. It's transcribed wrong. And that's not because of the transcriber, it's because the uh, stamps on those documents, they're not great. Unfortunately, the immigration officers didn't take great care to ensure that the stamp looked good on, uh, on all of these documents. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So here we have, we'll go back. So this is Harry Creed Baker. And we see that all we have for the arrival date is 1920. So let's take a look at the document. Okay, up here, it's unusual. The immigration official stamped this on the front of the card. And these are double-sided double cards. And usually we find the stamp on the back. In this case, it's on the front. And as you can see, it's not great. We can kind of make out 1920 and that's it. And so that's why only 1920 was transcribed. Uh, we can see here that there is a date that says May 28th, 1920. And that's the date of sailing. So if we add eight days onto that, you're looking at like a, a June 6th, give or take, arrival. Also that complicates this uh, document even more, we see a correction of the ship name. So. Uh, Grampian, and then we also see the Scotian. So how did they transcribe it? Let's go back. Uh, they transcribed it as the Grampian. So I would have to research that a little bit more to see if that's true, uh, if it was the Grampian. But if you were searching for the Scotian, it, uh, it wouldn't come up in your results. We also want to look at the back of this document. So you can do that by the left click arrow here on the screen. And we can see the back, which gives a physical description. And this is usually where we see the immigration stamp. And also, you may see a partial stamp here. It's a received by immigration. This is not the arrival date. Uh, this is actually when this document was received by the immigration department. So these documents did not stay at the ports of arrival very long. They maybe a week, and then they would send them uh, they would ship them to Ottawa where they would be received and stamped um, that that's the date that it was received in the office. So that's usually, yeah, about a week or so after the arrival date. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, moving on. So you've done all your preliminary research. Um, you're not getting any results. You're pretty sure you know the year of birth and pretty sure that you know the the arrival date but maybe it's not right so at this point if i'm not getting any results with the information that i have i want to go and research the canadian um any canadian sources uh, to see if i can gather more information of the person in canada so i'm really looking to confirm a uh, birth date if i don't already have it um and immigration 
uh, details. So there's a few different sources for in the Canadian records that you can find that information. As we can see at the bottom here, the key to being a successful genealogi genealogist is really being open to the possibility that what you know may not be correct. So there's no hard and fast rules. <laughs> so if you've approached your problems with that mindset, you'll have more results and you'll take more things into consideration. Okay, so first up I'd like to do, first collection I like to hit is the census records. And these records are important for immigration information because beginning in 1901, the Canadian government included an area on the census survey that was, if you were not born in Canada, when did you immigrate to Canada? And also naturalization years. So if, you're, if, if your family was in Canada before 1921, start with that census and work your way back. Find the person or the family in as many censuses as you can. Uh, if they went to the prairies before 1926, you start with the 1926 census. Unfortunately, that census is not on Ancestry.ca at this time, but you can find it on Family Search and you can find it on Library and Archives Canada. So start there, collect as much information as you can. Make note of uh, the year of birth and the year of immigration and the year of naturalization. And um, you're looking for consistencies. So if the documents, the census records are consistently saying that somebody arrived at a on a specific year, it's probably that year or it's really close. So what we're trying to do is really narrow our arrival year when we're searching the, the immigration um, records. <clears throat> and also that rings true for the birth year too, if you're not sure, like if you don't have a good source for the birth. Also, make note of the spelling variants. If you see the last name being spelt in a variety of ways on the census records, write all that down because you can use that and you can apply it to your immigration search. Nicknames as well or other uh, given names they might be using. And also if it's a family group, make note of the parents and make note of all the siblings and their ages and their names because if you can't find who you're looking for in the immigration records, you might be able to find a sibling or a parent that would lead you to the passenger list that shows your ancestor on it. So there's all kinds of information that you can obtain from these census documents. Um, I would say, yeah, if on the census record or in the oral history, it states that the person immigrated to Canada from 1914 to 1918, it's probably not correct. Uh, immigration really slowed during the war periods. So I would, it, but it, it's not impossible. I've definitely seen people coming in like 1916, but there's just not a lot. So I would expand my search in the Canadian arrival records to include anything before 14 and then again, anything after 1918. And I really want to go over this too. I know I'm trying not to <laughs> go over the tips too much, but um, children, if the family has a small child that's coming and, and it's coming with them, look for the youngest child in the family because there's not as many kids, there's not as many little children on board. So you're going to get, uh, you're not going to get a lot of results. Sometimes if I'm looking for a child that's like under one or under two years of age and nothing's coming up with the names, I will just eliminate the name search completely and just search by the year of birth with a plus or minus one or plus or minus two and the year of arrival and go through all the results that I have and look at anything that might be close. And on the flip side of that, Look for older people. If the father would have been over 50 years old or if there is a grandparent that were coming, look for them because there's not a lot of older folks that are immigrating to Canada. Uh, Canadian officials were really concerned that people uh, were able to support themselves and wouldn't become uh, like a ward of the state or that the, the country wasn't going to have to support the person financially. So there's not a whole lot of people coming kind of in that plus 50 uh, year range. So that's a, a, another technique that you can that you can use. And if you know that a family member arrived kind of 
after your ancestor, like maybe a sister or a parent, sometimes their immigration record can give you clues as to when your person arrives. So this is a good example of that here. We see Meyer Boslewski, and he is 54 years old, and he is with a, ch you know, a child, a young man, he's 11, Joseph. And you can see here, I made it nice and big. It says, to two sons, tailors, two years, Canada. So if you're looking for one of those sons, this would tell you that he would have arrived two years before his father came, plus or minus. It's not always right, but like it still will give you uh, a better idea. And this is also really interesting because it shows like this person who's over 54 and because he's older, he his sons basically would have had to have um, assured the government that they would be financially responsible for their father. So that would have been part of that, the, the immigration agreement in that situation. Okay, let's go back to, okay, no, we're good. All right, moving on, <laughs> sorry. Gosh, okay. <laughs> So other than the census records, we can also use birth and marriage and death records uh, in Canada to what we're looking for is to kind of find maybe an early, the earliest document that the person would have been captured. We're trying to create a timeline or create a window of when the person would have immigrated to Canada. So, you know, a marriage could confirm the Canada that like somebody was in Canada in Canada by a specific date. Like so, for instance, I was recently working with a patron, and they said that um, they were pretty confident that the person came in 1928, but I found a marriage record for them in 1926. So that moved my research parameters back. Um, the birth of a child in Canada can be a good indication of kind of when the family arrived. Uh, and back, kind of going back to the census records for a minute, if you see on those census records a family group and there's a child born in the family's country of origin, and then there's a child born in Canada, you can fairly confidently set that window between the two births as the immigration window. So if you have a child born overseas in 1890, but then you have a child born in Canada in 1893, you can fairly confidently say that that family arrived sometime between 1890 and 1893, and then you have a nice narrow window for your year of arrival, and that allows you to kind of open up your searching in the name and the surname and so on and so forth. Okay, so birth records sometimes will give us some nice information. It depends on the province and it depends on the time. So as we know, records are constantly evolving and changing. And what you see on one record one year, you won't see on a, on a record at a, at a different year. So this example is out of Ontario and it's from 1911. And we see Giovanni, he's born in January of 1911. And there's a nice little notation uh, down below that says the parents were married in Italy in 1905. So in this case, we can create that window. We know that the parents would have immigrated sometime between 1905, when they were married in Italy, and 1911, when Giovanni was born in Toronto. Death records can also give us information about uh, arrival. And again, it depends on the province and it depends on the time. And some records will have it and some records won't. This, again, is an, another example from Ontario. It's 1941. It's the death of Abraham. And we see here on the far right, it says that he was in Canada for 32 years. So you can just do that math. And, you know, that would be roughly the time of arrival if the person who was the informant had the correct information. So, again, grain of salt with this, but it's, it's a clue. Um, also nice on here, we see with Ab in Abraham's um, uh, example. Uh-oh, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, 
that he was in Windsor. He died in Windsor, but he had been in Windsor for 27 years. So there was five, five years um, that he lived somebody, somewhere else. And so that could be a good clue to locate other uh, documents as well. Okay, moving on. So if you're having problems finding somebody in the Canadian records, uh, what I will do at this point to save time <laughs> is to do a search ancestries family trees. So somebody might already be researching the family that you're looking for and could potentially have a full slew of uh, records that could be useful to you attached to the family. Now, mind you, these are hints only because it's somebody else's research. Uh, so you want to confirm, you want to analyze what they have and confirm it to make sure that, you know, that it's correct. But it's a really great way to potentially get some quick info. So what I usually like to do, let's go down to here. And so to search the family trees, just go right to the search. Mm -mm -mm. Down here, we see all these little green guys. Uncheck and just leave the family trees open. Put in your information for your person, and I usually like to add the spouse, and if I know the parents' names, I will include that as well to limit my results. And so that can be a quick and easy way to gather more information. Okay, so you've done all of this and you've tried messing with the arrival dates and the year of birth and you've gathered all the information and you're pretty sure that you know when this person came to Canada. You get a nice little tiny window that you're gonna set your uh, arrival year as and you're still not getting anything. Um, this could be because the surname is spelled differently when they came, maybe they adopted a more English uh, version of their name. Mm. The transcription of the surname could be wrong in the database. They may have used a different given name. I recently researched someone who was born in England under the name Ambrose, and in all the British documents, he's Ambrose, but then when he comes to Canada, he uses Gary for some reason. <laughs> I don't know where Gary came from, but he used Gary and immigrated under Ambrose. So, yeah, <laughs> so that happens too. Um, and the year of birth might be wrong or not captured at all on the documents. So these are kind of helpful for like choosing what information to eliminate from your searches. We'll get more into that. Okay, so surname differences. This is kind of the major one uh, that can cause a lot of problems when we're searching the 1865 to 1935 database. And uh, wildcard searching can really open up your results that you get. In Ancestry, you can use the star in place of six letters or a question mark in place of one letter. In the surname field, you need to have at least three letters for it to register a search. Uh, you can have your question marks and your um, stars anywhere but you have to have three letters or you won't get anything. And that's in the surname. Uh, in the given name, you can do a, a letter and a star and you'll get, uh, you'll get results. Um, I usually like to start with, in the surname, the first three letters and a star and see what comes up. And if I don't get anything that looks good, I'll start putting those letter, the, the wild cards kind of in amongst the letters. I like to eliminate vowels as much as possible because the A looks like an O, looks like an E. So if you can get rid of a bunch of vowels, that's really good. Um, and when you're researching like this, you really wanna have a narrow window of arrival in your first searches. So hopefully when you went through the gathering information um, uh, process, you are able to determine a, a, a really tight time frame that they came. And then of course, expand it, because it might not be right, but try really narrow, really narrow arrival. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So sometimes when women are traveling alone, they have a feminized suffix on their surname. So, you know, something like Olva or Ska, as opposed to Ski, 
I, in these situations, I like placing a question mark at the end of the name, and that's going to capture a ski with a I, a ski with a Y, or ska. And you can see kind of down below on this slide where, you know, I talk about Bukowski and how that would look when I'm just doing B star SK question mark. And again, eliminating the vowels in the searches and trying to keep it to identifiable letters can be very helpful. So given names, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, if a given name is different, it's usually because they're using a nickname or they're using the middle name or, you know, a totally different name. <laughs> no rules, genealogy, no rules, it's anarchy. Uh, women and children are listed by nicknames more often than adult men. And I like to use um, the family search wiki for nicknames and you can see the URL at the bottom there. If, you know, that's kind of a pain to uh, capture for you, Google search wiki, family search, nicknames, and it'll be, it should be your top result. Once you're there, you can just do a control F to, to, uh, to find and type in whatever, Margaret, and keep hitting enter, and it'll show you all the nicknames for Margaret. And, you know, it, and then you can use that for your searches or, at least if you're familiar with what the nicknames are, when you're reviewing your search results, it'll stand out to you because you'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I know I saw that and you know, it'll register and you'll know to, to click on it and look at that document. Um, given name variants are a little bit more tricky for non-British given names. So the process for immigration usually is that the immigrant would make their travel arrangements in their country of origin through an immigration agent. And so the information that they supply would be in their native language, which is, are reflected on the passenger list. So the whole idea that immigration changed surnames is um, not true. Uh, immigration is the immigration and, um, officers are just checking to make sure that the information on the passenger list is right. They're not, sometimes you'll see corrections or alternate names, uh, but it's not that whole situation where it's like, oh, you are now going to be Smith, and then the name becomes Smith. So what, we're, what we need to look for is the, the original version of the surname, which can be complicated. Um, but, you know, when you're looking in the, the Canadian records, especially the census records, you will see, you may see variants of the spelling of a name that is probably closer to the original spelling of the name, which would be located, which should be on the passenger list. Uh, for given names, the website I like to use is behind the name and specifically in the translate section. So see the URL there. Um, you can choose, uh, when you go into the translate area, you can choose kind of what country. So if you want to look for John Poland or John Hungary, uh, it'll tell you, it'll give you the, the variants of that name. So, which you can then use in the search for your immigrant in the database. If you have Jewish ancestors, I, there are some Hebrew versions on behind the name, but I like to use jewishgen.org, uh, their given name search database. Okay, so sometimes women immigrating from or via the UK are captured on a passenger list just as Miss or Mrs. Uh, and no given name at all. Uh, often you'll see them as Mrs. John William Anderson. Uh, it's commonly true for newlyweds, mostly around the turn of the century. But, you know, I've all, I also see women traveling with children and they're listed as Mrs. So-and-so. So you can put as many nicknames or many, as many variants on Mary or Margaret or whatnot in, that, in your search parameters, and it's not going to come up because it's going to be transcribed as Mrs. or Miss. So keep that in mind. You can eliminate the first name 
uh, and see what you get. Or just when you're kind of scrolling through your, res your results, look for those uh, first names that are transcribed as Mrs. or Miss and, and take a boo at those if everything else looks good and close. Uh, sometimes documents around this time also just include a first initial and a surname. And so again, eliminating the first name, it can be really helpful to get the result that you want. So here's a great uh, example of that and a great example of me misspelling a surname on my PowerPoint. <laughs> so it's the arrival of Jay Shulver and Mrs. Shulver in 1909. And uh, so yeah, this captures kind of both things where, you know, he's only listed as Jay and she's listed as Mrs. So if you were looking for Joseph Shulver, you're not gonna get a result that says Joseph Shulver. If you're looking for, you know, Rose Shul Shulver, you're not gonna get that. So taking out that, that first name can help with this. And, and this um, document's also kind of interesting. If you look at the kind of the top version, you can see that it's stamped returning Canadian. So Mr. Shulver had been in Canada. Uh, it looks like it says possibly, it looks like a five. Unfortunately, this happens, um, the immigration agents would stamp over the information or write over the information. But, uh, so this isn't uh, Jay Shulver's original immigrant um, document. So you would want to research for his uh, in like 1904 to see if you can find his original arrival. I assume he went back to England to, to marry and then he's bringing her to Canada with him. Okay, so we covered names and now we're going to cover birth and kind of why, um, what kind of errors we see uh, with birth. And um, first and foremost, Sometimes the records don't have an age on them. So if there's no age, then there's no year of birth. So when you put in a year of birth, it's not going to come up. So sometimes just leaving out that year of birth with your narrow year of arrival and some names can, can give you results. Sometimes the image is faded, and so the age is transcribed wrong. So like in this example, somebody's 27 and the seven's faded, the age gets interpreted as two, and then all of a sudden, your 27-year-old immigrant ancestor is now two years old. And you, you might not necessarily look at that because you're looking for someone who's 27, not two. So something to keep in mind, eliminating the age can, you know, of course, open up your results, but also kind of looking at stuff like that. Like if everything else is right, but the age is like drastically wrong or, you know, 10 years wrong, look at it anyway. Just look at everything that you think could be possible. Always look at that original document. Um, some women adjusted their ages. <laughs> can you imagine? So yeah, once they come to Canada, maybe they become a little bit younger. I recently found somebody who, you know, she was actually seven years older when she arrived than the age that she said she was or her year of birth when she, she, she was in Canada. And then um, sometimes it's true, people fudged the age of their children to get the cheaper fare. And that is all gonna depend on the time and the shipping line, usually around that like one to three year old or 10 to 14 uh, is when you see like child, like infant fairs, child fair, and then adult fair. So you might see somebody uh, listed on the passenger list a couple years younger uh, because the parents wanted, uh, wanted to get the cheaper rate. Why not, right? Okay, <laughs> we've done all the things again and we're still not getting anything it's like oh gosh you've eliminated names you've changed the you know eliminated the year of birth blah 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 you've done all the things you still don't have anything and often if this is the case it's because the record itself is not great and here's an example of what that looks like as you can see the first surname you can see is uh, Emily Mason but then anything after that it's just completely faded and not transcribed. Uh, and this is unfortunately fairly common in this collection. And it's because the arrival records were microfilmed in the 1950s and they were not microfilmed to archival standards. So there's some quality issues. Often it is this um, 
overexposure on the left hand side. So in this case, all the surname or the given names are pretty clear, uh, but you can't see the last names at all. In other cases where the people are listed given name first, surname second, you're going to see all the surnames and no given names. So this is where in your searching, eliminating one of the names might give you results. And when you're re reviewing results, if you see things that just have a last name and not a first name, but everything else matches, look at it and vice versa. Because, you know, it, it could be the person. I, for me, when those come up, I'm like, ooh, ooh I always check those. <laughs> and oftentimes, it's this kind of scenario. Okay. So, other sources to check. Main things that you want to look at are departure records, because those departure records are going to give you the port, uh, the destination port, and the ship, and the date. And you'll be able to take that information, plug it into the Canadian arrival, and really put those exact, and be really, really open with the, um, with the names and things like that. Uh, so, I included these five collections, the UK and Ireland O word passenger lists, 1890 to 1960, and the Hamburg passenger lists, 1850 to 1934. Then there's the Sweden immigration records and the Gothenburg passenger lists, which are great for people coming from Sweden, and the Swiss overseas immigration, which are, you know, great for our folks coming from Switzerland. I'm not going to go over those three, but I am going to go over the UK and the Hamburg. So, um, many people from Europe, Eastern Europe particularly, took smaller vessels to a British port, like from a European port to a small British port, which it's usually Hull or Grimsby that they're sailing into, and then they would take a train to one of the larger ports, so Liverpool or London or Southampton, and then they would board the steamship there and come to Canada. So they're transmigrating via the UK. So if you have family members who are coming from Eastern Europe during that 1890 to 1960 time frame, look in that UK departure database because you might see them sailing out of, out of a UK port. Uh, if you locate somebody on a departure list at about eight days, give or take, like, or more, to the departure date, and that will be your arrival date in Canada. Mm. And that UK collection uh, around turn of the century, you will also see the first names just as a J or Mrs. or Miss. The Hamburg departure records have a super bonus on them because they will tell you where the person resided before they left the country, before they immigrated. So this is really great for people who do not know where their family is from in Eastern Europe. Um, or they have a general idea, but it, it's more specific. So definitely take note of that. If you have already found your Canadian, uh, your, the Canadian arrival record for your family and you see that they came out of Hamburg, go to this passenger list and look it up and see where they were, where they were living. It might be different than what you already know, or it might be um, a situation where if you're not sure, this, this will give you um, direction for searching uh, your family uh, overseas. Um, okay, so also you're going to want to look at U.S. arrival records. Lots of people came to Canada via U.K. ports. So uh, the main ones here are New York, Boston, which is Massachusetts, and the U.S. Atlantic Ports passenger list. So make note of that one because that is where you find the Portland, Maine arrivals. And lots of people came through Portland, Maine. So if you have a, somebody who's coming through Portland, Maine, take a look in here. Um, especially if the person is coming to Canada before 1919 and they're coming in through a U.S. port. The United States asked um, for more details on their passenger list than Canada did before 1919. So um, you want that, you, that U.S. arrival record because it could give you more information um, about the person that you're researching. 
more information about on the Canadian arrival record pre-1919. So next, we're going to take a quick look at the U.S. border crossing records, which are my favorite. Um, the two main databases here are the border crossings from Canada to the U.S. and then also the Detroit border crossings. Uh, even if you don't think that your ancestor crossed the border into the U.S., look anyway, you would be surprised. It's not just people that are immigrating to the U.S. that are captured in this collection. Somebody could be going to the States for a business trip or to work for a short period of time, or they could be going to visit family. They could even just be going on a day trip and they, they could be captured in here. And I'm going to show you what um, two examples of these documents. So let's go back. Okay, so this is Bluma Zelda Hirschberg, and this is some research that I did recently for the Brown family. So I was looking for Harry Brown and um, the patient said that she didn't think they came in under the name Brown, but she didn't know what the surname was. So I was doing all that preliminary, that you know, research in Canada and the US and trying to gather as much information as I could. And I found this border crossing for Bluma after she was married and she's going to the States in 1936. So if we look at this document, we see this is a card, it's a double-sided card. And these are fantastic because down here in the left-hand corner, they were asked what their original seaport and date of landing and steamship is. So, with Bluma, she says, I came through Halifax in 1913, but I don't know the name of the ship. But, like, that's great. This is information that I can use when I go back to the Canadian arrival records and trying to find the, the Brown family. Um, again, this information given is from memory. So, oftentimes, it's not all right. But... Usually there's at least one piece of information given here that is accurate. So again, you include and exclude and, you know, adjust your, your year of entry and things like that when you're searching. The other beautiful thing about this document is right here. We see that um, Bluma lists her father as her next of kin in Canada, Harry Brown in brackets, but ding, 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 she gives his last name as Baru. And then Brown is in brackets. And so I was like, oh. And then when I took that information and went back to the arrival, uh, Canadian arrival records and searched for Baru, who did I find coming through Halifax in 1913 under the name Baru? So this is a really great example of how these documents that are created in North America can give excellent information. So my patient was thrilled because she didn't know that, you know, the Brown family were actually Baru. And they, like I said, these are double-sided, so always go and take a boo at the other side. You can rotate these from the toolbar over here, think, think. and you can see that there's additional information for um, Bluma that could be helpful uh, in, for whatever you're looking for, natural, uh, petition, naturalization positions in the U.S., so on and so forth. Uh, and another example of a border crossing is this one here. So this is Henry Owen Hamilton. And you can see this looks different. This is the passenger list style of border crossing. And I show you this because when you open it up, you're going to get this page. But these are two pages and sometimes three. So you're going to want to right click on this little arrow button here and it brings you to page two. And then on the far right column, you're going to see that original immigration information. And again, it's not always right, but there's usually something in there that's correct. So, and these people give pretty exact dates, which is fantastic. But again, um, and if you don't see this, if you go to page two and you don't see this, right click again, whoops. And you'll 
you will, I mean, it's blank here, but <laughs> there, that information will be on the third page on the left hand side. Okay, moving on. Oop. Okay, <laughs> so we still don't have anything. There's one more source, and this is the long game. This is not the short game. It's the Canadian Citizenship and Naturalization Records. So these records are not digitized and online. They are still protected under the Privacy Act of Canada, and they need to be requested from the Canadian government. So it, um, it's a, an access to information and privacy um, request to the Department of Immigration Citizenship Department of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. So they're the ones that hold these documents. And you're not asking for a certificate because sometimes people, they have this, those, those really nice certificates. They're often green, and, but those don't give arrival information on them. What you're requesting in this situation is the naturalization application paperwork. And that should have port of arrival, date of arrival, and ship on it. And so then when you get that information back from the government, then you can take that and re, um, redo your arrival record search in the arrival records databases. And I'm going to show you um, the index for these documents. So the index is on Library and Archives Canada. So let's go back to here. Okay. So if you go to Library and Archives Canada, you can go into Discover the Collection, and you want immigration. And up here you'll see Citizenship and Naturalization Records. So clicky clicky on Citizenship and Naturalization Records. Do, 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 do. Yeah. And it's going to take us to a page that there's two databases. Okay. So let's go here to naturalization records 1915 to 1951. And you can see these two databases right here. Search by name up until 46 and then search by date. But we want the search by name. I'm going to show you this because this is the easiest. So yeah, easy peasy. Type in a name. I'm just going to look for anybody with the surname beginning with B-A-R. So we can um, take a look. Now this is only, only um, records created after 1915 survived. So if your immigrant was naturalized before 1915, there's probably not anything in here. But I always check anyway because sometimes people have new files opened at a later date. So if you got all the information that you gathered at, uh, from the census records, you should know the year of uh, naturalization from that. So you would, use the, you would apply that to this. So let's take a look. Okay, let's look at Paul. Paul Barron from Poland. So click on that result, and you'll see here that there is um, a PDF. So you want to bring that PDF up. And this gives you all the details that you will need in your application. And yeah, name, country, date of the certificate, residence, and most importantly, over on the left here, the number and series. And this is how they're going to find that application paperwork is by this. And um, if you go back, Library and Archives Canada has a nice little area here that tells you how to obtain copies so they give you the details on how you know how, how you do the how you do the um, the request to get those documents okay let's go back so another reason why you can't find the record is they may have come before 1865, but I'm not going to go into this in great detail at all because it's really um, difficult research to do, and there's not a lot of sources. Canada didn't start keeping immigration records until 1865, so there's very few that have survived for the pre-1865 um, time frame. There are a couple 
sources on Ancestry.ca that you can look at, and I've listed those there. Um, correspondence, paperwork, uh, St. Lawrence Steamboat uh, passenger list, and a couple Irish um, arrival databases. Um, for the pre-1865, look at the U.S. arrivals. People were coming to Canada via the U.S., and those databases generally start around like 1820, give or take. So look for them coming through through the U.S. if they're coming before 1865. If your family's coming from Germany before 1865, check that Hamburg da database. You might see them leaving Hamburg. And some alternative sources are can be obituaries if there's a, a good um, good detailed obituary. You might find some information there. Uh, land records can actually give information. I found information on a land petition in Nova Scotia from 1808 that said that the person arrived in September of 1791. So, which was a total shock. I wasn't even looking for immigration <laughs> information. So you can find it in like the, the no stone left unturned. You never know what you're gonna uncover. Uh, and county history books can also be really helpful. If your ancestor was a pioneer in a specific area, they may be um, captured in a county history book, or you can find information about those first settlers, uh, the arrangements for arrival when that group came, and so that can, can reveal some information about those pre-1865 arrivals as well. Um, other, another reason, and probably the last reason why you're not able to find that document in the 1865 to 1935 collection is because they came after 1935. So just like the naturalization records, all records of arrival to Canada after 1935 are protected under the Privacy Act of Canada. So they require uh, an A-type request to get them. Um, and what you're looking, what you're asking for is a, a landing document. So they take a bit, again, it's the long game because they take about two to three months to, 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 to get a response uh, and to get that document. But um, it's not impossible. It's just a little bit of a wait. So who can request the 1935 arrival record? So the person who immigrated can request their own document. There is no fee for somebody to request their own document from the government. Um, anyone can request the record of a living person with that person's consent. And there is a federal government consent form that needs to be filled out and signed by the person who immigrated. And that is submitted along with the ATIP request. Anybody can request the record of a person who's been deceased for longer than 20 years. You do need to provide proof of death. Uh, the executor of an estate can request the record of a person deceased fewer than 20 years, and you need to provide proof of death and proof that you are the executor of the estate. You need to be a Canadian citizen in order to uh, request gover federal government records. So proof of death, they're really flexible on proof of death. So if you They'll take uh, a death certificate, of course, a funeral notice, an obituary, a photograph of a gravestone. Send copies. Don't send originals. You won't get them back. Um, Google search. If you're looking for an obituary, a lot of them, you know, in the last 10 years or so, lots of steps online. So you can Google the person's, like, name, obit, and province or area. Something might come up. And also digital newspaper websites like uh, newspapers.com. Really great source. Lots of um, papers from the prairies on there. So I found a lot of obituaries in, in this. And also the Montreal Gazette is on, on um, newspapers.com. And that's one of my favorite uh, newspapers for sure. So a couple other things to consider when you're submitting your request for a post-1935 arrival. You want to um, tell them to look for the person under the name that they arrived under. So if they changed their name at all, they used a more Canadian sounding first name or last name, include the original because uh, that's what the person's going to come under. Um, and then the contact information will have, you know, the person's name that they use today. Um, for women, if a woman arrives single, and married in Canada, you will be looking for her record under her maiden name. 
However, in the contact information, it's going to be her given name and her married name. And so what the government is going to want is a document that shows that name change from her maiden name to the name she uses today. So I always recommend to submit um, a marriage, a copy of a marriage license or record or maybe even an announcement of the marriage in a newspaper, like just something that shows that she changed her name from this to this because she was married. I have seen um, requests be delayed by the government because they want that proof. They want, they want the, to, to know the, yeah, the, they want to see that, that name change proof. Okay, there's more sources for the post 35. So it's not going to be the arrival information because that's still with the government, but you can find like the ship name and the port and uh, the date of departure from other sources. So of course, your UK departure records up until 1960, take a look. Um, the Sweden records, the Swiss records, those will contain the ship and the date of departure and the port of um, the, the destination port. Um, the Can there's a Canadian National Railway collection on Ancestry that's really great. That goes up until 1961 and that also will contain the ship and the port of arrival and the arrival date on them. And then there's a little index card collection that doesn't appear to be very helpful, but <laughs> it's uh, the records of aliens pre-examined in Canada 1904 until 1954. Mm. Mm. And I like this collection. Um, it's most often useful for people whose family arrived right around that 1935 period. So, because that's our cutoff, right? So they're like, oh, we think they came before 1935, but I'm not finding anything in the main database. I'll take a boo in here, um, because if they arrived in 36 or 37 or 38, they're not going to show in the Canadian arrival records, and then you have to submit an ATIP request to the government to, to get those documents. So it just tells me that... Uh, I'm not going to find anything online for these folks and tell people how to request from the government in that situation. Um, yeah, and as I've been saying, people immigrated through uh, the U.S. And so take a look at those U.S. arrival records. They go up until 57, 63, 59. So if you're, you think that maybe, you know, they came through New York, and they're arriving before 57, take a look, you, you might be surprised. And then there's also this uh, newer collection to Ancestry.ca. It's Africa, Asia, Europe, passenger lists of displaced persons, 1946 to 1971. So if your family member was a victim of Nazi persecution or a displaced person after World War II, you might be able to find um, departure list in here. And I would recommend if you do find information for your family here, go to the original source for these documents, which is the Rolson Archives. And you can see the um, URL at the bottom there. They often have more documents for the person. So I've seen medical records uh, on their website. I've seen uh, marriage documents uh, for marriages that took place in the displaced persons camps after the war, and I've seen, um, there's also registration cards, lots of registration cards, so you might find more information on a Rolson Archives. Uh, and also, you have the opportunity to submit a research request to them. So, there's, of course, not everything's digitized for them yet, so they could have even more information in Germany for your family member. So. Yes, if you find anything in the database on Ancestry, go to a Rolson, a Rolson Archives and take a look there. Okay, <laughs> so hopefully we're under time. Um, museum is currently closed, but because of wonderful websites like Ancestry.ca, myself and the other researchers at Pier 21 are able to do a lot of research from home. So. Uh, me and uh, the five other researchers on staff are diligently working on research requests 
if you have a question, if you know, you've tried all these things and you still can't find the person, you can submit a research request to us via our website. And you can see the URL right there. It's www.peer21.ca slash family history. Um, and yeah, you just follow the prompts and it'll take you to a form that you'll fill out, submit it, gets emailed. We do research and we email you back with what we find or maybe more questions. It's mostly immigration focused, but there is a section that is, uh, I have a genealogical question. So we can help you with your brick walls or, you know, any other queries that, that you might have of a, of a, of a genealogical nature. Okay. So thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you, uh, learned a little bit more about uh, immigration and the immigration record collection. Um, hopefully you'll be able to apply some of the, the, these strategies to your own research and uh, get, get those results that, that you're looking for. So thanks everybody. Take care.